today's topic is going to be about continuous simulation and how that's accomplished in XP Swim and also um, uh, where you know where you would go to um, invoke these sort of uh, types of models and I've got some sample models to show you as well so I, I hope that you find today's uh, webinar informative and useful in your modeling efforts as Nicole mentioned my name's Tony Cooch uh, here's a picture of me she mentioned about the University of Guelph it's interesting that this topic is about continuous simulation since at the University of Guelph I had Dr. Bill James as my uh, advisor for my master's thesis and it was really there that I was uh, indoctrinated in the importance of continuous simulation. This is our eighth webinar in about the last six months and as Nicole mentioned these webinars uh, we record them and we place them on our website. Um, here's the web address but in fact if you just go to xpsoftware.com there's an XP Live button right on the home page that will take you right to the section about this webinar and previous ones. I anticipate that this webinar will be less than an hour in duration. The subtopics uh, for this continuous simulation is really I'm going to talk about the advantages and perhaps the disadvantages even though well I would say now that those disadvantages are diminishing uh, about continuous simulation. Uh, su the supporting hydrology methods that are available for continuous simulation uh, the management and the processing of the time series, so the utilities that are in the XP Swim and Swim model to uh, manage those sort of uh, long time series of data. Uh, and in the hydraulic mode, how do you um, look after things like evaporation and exfiltration losses from ponds? I'm going to use some typical models to demonstrate these capabilities. Now I figure we should start with the uh, definition of continuous modeling. What am I talking about? Well, I'm really talking about the simulation of a chronological record of precipitation, a long time series of rain. For example, it might be several decades long at an hourly time step. Of course, for um, urban catchments that have a fast response time, you would want um, a much a smaller time step than that so maybe a time interval of 5 or 15 minutes and uh, that might even be a shorter time span that you're using. Uh, of course uh, continuous simulation could be anything that's just longer than an event. Stringing two events together is really a continuous simulation. Uh, the um, output of a continuous simulation is a continuous chronological record of the runoff hydrograph and possibly other time series that are computed and in the SWIM model there are other time series that could be viewed and displayed and analyzed like the infiltration over time, the evaporation, the groundwater and so on. The output is typically analyzed in a statistical way because of the nature of the continuous time series. You might say, well what's the peak flow? Well isn't there going to be a peak flow for every single a storm event that's within that continuous simulation. So you analyze it statistically and you rank events, uh, give them return periods and so on. The history about continuous modeling, I have to say it's not new. The first model I'm aware of is the Stanford watershed model in 1966. Uh, the SWIM model of which XP SWIM is derived, uh, 1971 and HSPF. In 1980, these are all, uh, well, the last two anyway, are currently in use as continuous simulation models. Uh, so it's not a new um, science or a new capability. However, it is newly being uh, adopted throughout uh, the country for stormwater management. In the SWIM model, the continuous modeling can be performed on both hydrology and hydraulics, so within the runoff mode and within the hydraulics mode. We're going to do continuous modeling on the rainfall runoff calculations, so this is going to be inclusive of infiltration and evaporation uh, throughout the simulation. Uh, groundwater is optional, but you know that's the capability that's there. You could simulate with the groundwater and the groundwater surface interaction. For example, with the water table rising to the ground surface, you could cut off the infiltration rate. Snowmelt and the accumulation of snow in the snowpack, uh, this is a, 
capability that can be simulated in the SWIM model on a continuous basis. The water quality buildup, so the buildup of pollutants on the catchment and then their wash off. And some of the wash off uh, formulations that you can use are going to be based on how much pollutants are available. So during dry periods, pollutants build up on the catchment. And so when there's a, a new runoff event, then you could have like a first flush of pollutants because there's been a long dry period where pollutants have built up. The scour and deposition of pollutants in conduits based on the velocity in the conduit is something that works well in a continuous simulation. Uh, pollutant removal in treatment devices, so if you're simulating LID or other BMPs that are removing pollutants, this can be done on a continuous simulation. And then finally, uh, the fully dynamic routing of flows and pollutants. With the exception of this last one, these other things are actually computed quite fast, but the fully dynamic routing is a little bit slower. There's a lot more computational effort that's needed there, and so that takes a little bit longer on the computer, and I would say it's quite frequent to do a continuous simulation of everything up to that point and then pick um, specific events to simulate for the hydraulics. We're talking about modeling the complete or at least uh, most of the hydrologic cycle for the catchment. Uh, most stormwater controls, for example, like LID, regional detention, retention facilities, they rely on evapotranspiration and infiltration. This is um, the, you know, a motivator for doing the continuous modeling. It's important, for example, in predicting what the um, runoff hydrograph will be is to what's the state of the um, retention detention facilities are they empty or are they half full and so on when was the last storm what's the soil condition like the advantages of continuous simulations include uh, obviously the antecedent moisture the program is going to determine what this condition is with the start of each storm Basically, a continuous simulation removes that engineering judgment of the selection of the antecedent moisture. You're basically simulating a water balance. So it's a complete description of what's happening. The evaporation, the infiltration, the depression storage, in the continuous model, there's code uh, to simulate each of these processes. So it's a complete uh, simulation that's um, being done during the dry period. Sometimes people have referred to this as the non-event. You're going to be able to um, recover infiltration capacity and uh, surface storage, where water is stored on the surface and, and not running off. In LID facilities, uh, you're basically able to evaluate what would the runoff hydrograph be or what would the performance be if that facility is not completely empty which it may be if the um, drying time for it has not been um, reached because of the frequency of these storm events that are occurring. There's uh, great statistics that continuous simulations can generate. You actually can generate the true return period for the runoff event because it's a false assumption to say that design storm of a certain return period causes a flooding event of a certain ret return period. That's rarely met because it's really dependent on the moisture and any um, water that's already stored within the network or on the ground and so on. So you use the statistics of the output time series directly from a continuous simulation model. It uses real rainfall time series. So you know, there's another assumption that a design storm is representative of the storms. That's not true. You're going to be able to get the true pattern, uh, you know, a real variety of rainfall patterns are going to be found on the continuous record. It's the intensity of the rain that is the number one thing in generating the shape of the hydrograph. So by using a real rainfall time series, the intensities throughout that time series are going to be giving you hydrograph shapes that are representative of how the catchment is performing for that rain record. 
you can simulate groundwater. So the inclusion of groundwater and the surface water interaction is very important, especially in places with shallow groundwater tables uh, and in order to simulate a, a seasonal response. Perhaps like during a wet season, the groundwater table rises to the surface and it's cutting off infiltration. This is easily simulated in a continuous simulation model. Most of the losses for evapotranspiration and infiltration occur between rainfall events. So in a continuous model then, you're able to get a good estimate of that part of the uh, hydrologic cycle. So the water budget, the, you know, the percent that's evaporated, the total percentage of runoff and so on. You know, think about a pie chart, all the water input and then where, where are all the sinks for it. I've made a little note here. I remember about 15 years ago there was pretty good academic discussion about if evaporation should be occurring during rainfall and snow periods or should it be turned off. We thought that we should give that option to the users and in XPSWIM if you use a configuration parameter called SVAP, SVAP, then it will turn off evaporation during the rainfall. So when it's raining there'll be no evaporation. The default though is to um, use the constant evaporation for whenever they evaporate, whenever the, the surface is wet and we can evaporate from the nonlinear reservoir. There are some disadvantages of continuous simulations. I've noted that here that these disadvantages are diminishing and the ones that I put the little arrow down, they're not, they're becoming less and less uh, important over time. So one of them that's not really changing, I guess to be honest I should probably put an arrow up here, the number of input parameters. Since more processes, processes are simulated, there's more input parameters. So there's more data that you have to gather or estimate or calibrate in the continuous simulation. I say this is increasing. It's not really increasing for the SWIM model, but as you go to different hydrology methods, there may be more and more parameters that you have to have estimates for. The uh, model runtime, so it does definitely take longer to do a continuous simulation than just for a single event, but today's computers are very fast and the run times are reasonable for durations of, say, tens of years, decades. The uh, runtime can be quite dependent on the inclusion of a hydraulic simulation. So if you do a fully dynamic hydraulic solution, then this definitely is going to take uh, a longer amount of time than if you were to exclude it and only do a hydrology analysis or simple hydraulic analysis. The disk space and file size, well, um, I've seen cases where people have reached the uh, Windows limit of a 2 gigabyte file size that can be addressed. You do definitely get copious amounts of data and it's possible to, you know, overwhelm the graphing routines. You know, it might be a little bit sluggish to see the hydrograph when it has tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of points to be graphed. One example would be the number of rows in Excel. So if you export from a model and you've got more than the 64,000 rows that are permitted, then what? Then what? You know, Obviously, you'd have to go to a different program, but like Access or something, which doesn't have this kind of limit. The lack of rainfall data, uh, more and more rainfall data is available. For example, there are commercial uh, organizations which will provide you ground corrected radar rainfall data for periods of time that you specify uh, at quite good scale as far as the spatial and temporal. So one thing that happens is that sometimes there's too coarse of a time step for the rainfall data. In an urban catchment or a small catchment, something that responds quickly, you need to get down to um, 15 or 5 minute data is desired. Hourly data might be satisfactory and daily data, I would say that you should avoid it. Daily data is not good enough for simulation of an urban catchment. The applications of continuous simulations, well, the design analysis of LID, which I've talked a little about, the simulation on how effective is my detention and retention facilities. You know, how are they performing when I put a typical wet year or when I do the last 10 years, how are they, how are they performing? The simulation of 
RDII, rain-derived infiltration and inflow in a sanitary sewer or in the sanitary portion of a combined sewer. How is that, how's that happening? And, of course, that's a great one for a seasonal response. If you think about places like Seattle and Vancouver, which have wet, uh, long, wet winters, um, they're going to get a lot of rain-derived infiltration inflow in the winter months and not in uh, summer months. The simulation of wetlands, establishing water quality loads to receiving waters, uh, looking at morphology, stream morphology, hydro modification. So in a case where you are trying to make sure that pre and post development is not only not exceeding some sort of uh, peak flow or runoff volume, but looking at it more holistically for hydro modification. You can see things like the duration and the number of exceedances. Maybe that's a water quality objective or a water quantity objective. These things can be done with continuous modeling and with the analysis of the resulting time series. The hydrology methods that are in XP SWIM, which are which can hand, or which can simulate continuous simulation with good description, include what we call the runoff method the nonlinear reservoir, the same method in EPA SWIM, kinematic wave method, uh, Lorentzian method, this Lorentzian method is a hydrology method from Australia, and the time area method, although this one does have limited catchment description. The, I see from time to time through my work as the manager of client services of XP Software many attempts to use SCS hydrology on a continuous basis, but this doesn't work. We don't recommend this at all because the SCS hydrology uses a concept of an initial abstraction and then some continuing losses. This initial abstraction is reset arbitrarily and not reset in any kind of a physically descriptive way. So this SCS unit you know, hydrograph method is not recommended for continuous modeling. However, I should draw your attention to that there are two configuration parameters to uh, allow a continuous uh, simulation of it, SCS CONT for SCS continuous, and SCS DER equals X, where you enter for X the number of days to suppress the um, initial abstraction. So perhaps if you wanted to do like a 10-day or two-week uh, wet period with SCS hydrology and you didn't want the initial abstraction to arbitrarily reset on you, you could suppress it using these two configuration parameters. For example, SCS dir equals 10 so that there would be no initial abstraction reset for the 10 days. The um, Nonlinear reservoir, the EPA swim runoff method, this is a conceptual visualization of it where we have the inputs of precipitation and snow melt would be like an equivalent precipitation coming to this uh, reservoir here. There's evaporation occurring of any water that's on the surface and infiltration occurring if there is, uh, if it's a pervious um, surface. On an impervious area, this infiltration would be zero. And we get an, a net accumulation of a depth on the surface. And once the depth has gone beyond what we call DS, depression storage, then we compute the flow with this, basically a form of Manning's equation. It's called nonlinear reservoir because it's D minus DS raised to the 5 thirds. This W is the subcatchment width. So this is being continually evaluated. So in a continuous model, Let's say we get to the point where the precipitation is um, less than the infiltration rate, then this depth is going to diminish and eventually it will be less than DS and the runoff hydrograph will cease. The water that's in here is going to be evaporated until it becomes dry. This is continually evaluated. The infiltration now that's occurring, there are f um, four choices. Uh, in the XP SWIM for modeling infiltration. We recommend the green amped because this is a physically based infiltration method that's being satisfactory. It uses a recovery parameter, which I'll show you in just a moment, in order to um, in order to get back the infiltration rate after a storm event. 
uniform loss and SES curve number. We don't recommend these for continuous simulation since they're basically going to give you constant losses and not losses reflective of the the amount of infiltration that's occurred in previous um, um, storms. This green amped equation, I won't do a lot of detail here, but I do want you to realize that there's two sets of equations for the case where the FS is the um, cumulative amount of infiltration to cause surface saturation. So there's a set of equations before and after surface saturation. And a special note here that the infiltration rate is equal to the rain rate before the surface is saturated. And once that happens, then we start evaluating it and you'll notice that the cumulative infiltration is uh, going to be um, evaluated using parameters that are physically descriptive of the soil. The initial moisture deficit, the sat saturated hydraulic conductivity, and the average capillary suction. These are things that you can measure. We say it's deterministic. The Horton method is not deterministic. Um, this is why it's just satisfactory for continuous simulation. It is, starts out at initial rate and decays to uh, ultimate or final infiltration rate. That final infiltration rate is usually equal to or, or related to the hydraulic conductivity. And in the equation, you'll notice it only decays over time. However, um, the SWIM model is a little bit smarter than that. It realizes that in cases where the uh, rainfall is less than the infiltration capacity, or there, are, there is no rain, for example, in this fourth time period here, we shouldn't be decaying this uh, infiltration capacity to that level. We should only ba basically decay it based on the amount of rainfall. And so in the Horton method, what happens is we use an equivalent time by using this amount of volume and only decaying the infiltration capacity based on the level of uh, infiltration that's occurred and not um, just based on time, as this equation would show. Now the um, SWIM model does regenerate the Horton infiltration, and there's a parameter here in the job control, so you must check regeneration of Horton infiltration capacity if you're doing a continuous simulation, so that after a, a long enough dry period, you're going to get back the infiltration capacity. It will go again back up to the um, maximum capacity, for example, if there's been a long enough dry period. The groundwater um, capability in the SWIM model, it's a two-compartment groundwater model that simulates the mounding. So basically we're talking about the rise and fall of this groundwater table. The groundwater can be redirected to other nodes and links, and in the hydraulics mode it could be redirected if you choose a simultaneous um, solving of runoff and hydraulics. Now there's a bit more description in here. There's a groundwater outflow equation and you can describe the evapotranspiration and how much evapotranspiration comes from upper and lower zone. You can truly do a good surface water, groundwater interaction and description there and run this on a continuous basis. The um, output of continuous simulation models, uh, this comes from runoff. It's basically a water budget or water balance for the entire run. You can also get this kind of information for each individual subcatchment, but I think this is um, representative enough. So you can see, for example, how much precipitation there was, how much infiltration, how much evaporation, surface runoff from watersheds, and then a continuity check as well on what kind of error that was. And so you see for the three-year period that I analyzed, there was 100.5 inches total. And over that period of time, I had 13.4 inches of evaporation. In a continuous simulation, evaporation losses and infiltration losses become significant. During an event, a lot of times these things are ignored or they're just lumped as a constant value. But during a continuous simulation, we actually look at the details like that. This is the time series output from XP Swim for that same set of results I just showed you in that um, text file. 
So this is the three-year period. You'll notice there's one big event in the summer of 1987. This rainfall data comes from Minneapolis, for example. Now, you'll notice that the, I've got the rain and corresponding flow here. In fact, uh, when you get down to the details and you start zooming in to different periods of time, I've also shown here the infiltration rate. So you can see the decaying infiltration rate, which is the uh, pink um, dashed line, the rain in blue, and then the corresponding runoff hydrograph. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that I've decayed the infiltration rate to about a half inch per hour right here on the 21st, and then there has been enough dry period of time for that infiltration rate to recover to about one and a half inches per hour on the evening of the 20, well, uh, late evening on the 23rd. So you can see um, what's happening in the continuous model by especially looking at rain and infiltration uh, over time like that and, and drilling down into the time series like I've done. This is just a zoom in from the uh, graph before. Now with um, continuous simulation, interface files become important. Interface files are binary files that contain rain, flow, pollutant concentrations. Um, I think that's all that's on them. Um, they're binary. They're very compact, so they don't take up a lot of size. And they allow the different parts of the swim model to talk to each other. In a uh, continuous simulation, we typically use a rainfall interface file. So there's a utility that can create a rain interface file. And then in the runoff mode, I can create flow interface file from those hydrographs. I could analyze them. I could read that same file into the hydraulics mode. And one key thing is if you want to analyze overflow statistics, then you, you need to use the last option, which is create a new file in the hydraulics layer. All the outflows go there. And then you could analyze with the statistics utility um, the overflow ends. Now this um, statistics utility can analyze some um, rain and do an analysis of the rain by taking the long record of rainfall and then going to, in that utility, you can then do a, an analysis, a synoptic analysis, and it will break up the long rainfall record into events using an inter-event time. So you um, specify, oh, it's, you know, six hours, for example, is the average dry period that creates a new storm, and then it will break it up whenever there's six dry hours, then it's a new storm. And it breaks it up that way and ranks it. There's um, utilities for other time series, like temperature and wind. Those are for snowmelt calculations. And you access these from the tools menu, utilities. This allows you to process fixed formats like National Weather Service, Atmospheric Environment Service, uh, that's for Canada. Uh, your own user-defined um, formatted files you can process as well. These I mentioned about the breaking up. So for example, I can break up rain or flow with this inter-event time. So you specify, oh, for example, six hours as what's showing here. So six hours of dry means it's a new event. Uh, there's a return period calculator based on this plotting position parameter. It will typically give you a return period uh, about two times longer than the time series. But you can make an adjustment in the value of A. And of course, you could um, take the results and you could fit them to uh, like a log Pearson uh, distribution and then um, generate your own. Uh, return period statistics, but it does do a, a simple estimate of return period. And you can choose what you analyze for. In this case, for the rain, I'm going to analyze depth, intensity, storm duration, and inter-event duration. On the statistical side for flow, you can analyze for total flow, average flow, peak, event duration, and inter-event duration. Inter-event duration means dry period. And I've checked that I'm going to get a table of these things and the statistical moments. The moments are things like standard deviation, coefficient of variation, skewness, those sort of things. So those are called statistical moments. These um, tables look like this. I've just took a little snippet of it and you can see the um, 
I'm looking at total flow. So this is the event with the largest total flow. It has a return period of 5.33 years. Uh, the next biggest one is a two year and so on. And so you can see it gives also a percent greater than as it's taken the long series and broken it up. In the hydraulics mode, it's important that you understand uh, about this evaporation. There's a lot of confusion I see with users about evaporation because they know in the runoff mode they've checked and they've included evaporation to be calculated. So this is the evaporation of the water that's on the surface as it's running off. Then once it's run off and it becomes in, it goes into a hydraulic network like into links and nodes, it might end up in say a storage node like a pond or a lake. If you want to be able to evaporate from there, see normally this is just ignored because you simulate an event, but in a continuous model, that um, water that's standing in storage devices should be allowed to be able to evaporate and of course physically does evaporate. And so in order to do that you use a configuration parameter called HDR underscore evap, meaning hydraulics mode evaporation, and then you click on the evaporation here and you enter the values that you want to use. And of course I've put these are so many inches as monthly values. But it is important to do both things. It's not enough just to click evaporation and put in data. In order to calculate that um, evaporation, you need to use this configuration parameter, HDR underscore evap. Otherwise, this data is actually used only for, without the parameter, it would only be used for storage treatment devices. In the hydraulics mode, if you want to simulate infiltration or exfiltration losses from ponds, for example, into the ground, you have a couple of choices that one would be to use a negative constant inflow or a negative user inflow hydrograph. I'm not sure if you're aware, but you can put a negative number for your hydrographs, and that is just a withdrawal from the model. But uh, ideally, the best description would be to use an internal rating curve based on head or depth versus flow and direct that to some sort of outfall. So you'll notice in the little bit of model that I've cut out here, I have this pond and it has a discharge structure which it goes through this multi-link but losses from the pond I use another multi-link and inside here pond loss link I have an internal rating curve that says a certain depth in the pond and a certain flow rate out into this node GW like groundwater or ground and you can get um, water out of the pond that way you can combine the infiltration and the evaporation losses from ponds. So now I'd like to get to um, some of the models that I have set aside to show you which uh, are using continuous simulation in some of these concepts. So the first is this um, XP Swim model for sanitary sewer network in Norwalk, Connecticut. So what's in the background here is actually uh, GIS shape files for the buildings and the lots. So the tax map is in here. And I'm in the runoff mode. And if I double click on this node right here, there's some um, two catchments here. And this has been calibrated to describe the amount of flow that's getting into the sanitary sewer for uh, rainfall response. So here's the rain. And here's the corresponding hydrograph. Now this corresponding hydrograph is also in the hydraulics mode limited but its capture to 30 percent. So I've calculated and calibrated the hydrograph and then I said in here I'm only going to use 30 percent of that as what gets into the sanitary sewer. So this model is quite large and number of links and nodes. There are actually three places of flow metering records and here's one of them. And if I review results on this one I, I'm showing you uh, both flow, measured flow, and computed flow. Let me just reduce my graph to only showing flow. So the blue is the measured response, and the orange is the computed response. So you can see, for example, after several weeks of simulation, there's a big wet weather event, and the model does have good correlation with uh, observed data. I'll show uh, one more sanitary sewer model. 
this one uses uh, some fairly new um, concepts for simulating wet weather, which is this RDII. This is the RTK method. This RTK method is three unit hydrographs. These three unit hydrographs have only three parameters to describe them. The fraction of rainfall that becomes that hydrograph, the time to hydrograph peak, and the ratio of the base time to the peak time. These have uh, these represent short, medium, and long-term responses. So you can see the time to hydrograph peak for the long term happens to be 12 hours. So there's very little parameters to make an adjustment when you're calibrating. So it's quite a successful way to calibrate wet weather response. And of course, you can do that on a continuous simulation. And if I switch to the hydraulics mode and look at the computed versus observed for this sanitary sewer, you can see a pretty good uh, level of um, correlation. Let me uh, zoom in. Again, the blue is the computed, sorry, is the measured gauge data, and the orange is the computed response. So it's quite good correlation. You can see the overall dry weather flow pattern in here. The um, spikes that you see in the measured flow and, of course, in the computed flow as well are all related to an upstream pump station. So there's a pump station up here, and there's lots of pump start and stops, which are causing the slugs of flow to be seen in the network. Let me open up a different model now, a stormwater one. I want you to see, uh, I should have this in my list of recent files. In this one, this is where um, and it's in this model that I've done the continuous simulation of the pond losses. So if I um, double click on this link for pond loss, here's my, in the special category or column, I've got internal rating curve. And the internal rating curve I have here is a depth in the pond versus flow out of the pond, you know, like flow into the ground. How I came up with these numbers uh, is I used Darcy's Law, the hydraulic conductivity of the soil, and the area of the pond or lake at increasing depths. And so the multiplication of all those things, I've, I've come up with a depth in the pond versus an outflow. And the simulation of the evaporation is accomplished by the configuration parameters, as I mentioned, HDR underscore EVAP, so adding this parameter here, and then the inclusion of the evaporation as either monthly or daily values in the hydraulics job control. If I look at the, um, if I look in runoff, for example, I can see the three years of simulation of rain in orange here. The green happens to be my flow, and then I've got pollutant concentrations. This is the hydrograph and pollutograph that goes into the pond from that particular node. Each of these nodes has a similar um, type of graph. And then if I look in the hydraulics mode and I review results on the pond, I'll be able to show you the stage versus time of the pond. There's actually a control structure here which controls the water level to 924.75. I'm just going to zoom in. So this is the three years of the level of the pond. I'm going to zoom in and let you see that the water level in the pond sometimes drops below the control level. How can it do that? Well, it does that. It drops below control because the water is evaporating from there and or the water is infiltrating into the ground during those periods where there's no storms. Of course, when the water level is rising, that's when there's inflows because there's a storm. Uh, I do want to return back to um, this graph for a moment of the
um, hydrology. Let me make an adjustment and include the infiltration. This is actually one of the questions that's been asked already. How do you turn on the infiltration onto the graph? You actually do it by clicking on this um, properties icon and clicking it infiltration and it will allow you to see the infiltration and the rain. I'm going to um, zoom into this period of time, this record, and this is where you can get a better understanding of what's happening. You see I can see that the infiltration rate is decaying over time and then as I showed before in my PowerPoint it's recovered all the way to this value because of the, that many dry days. But if I find a period of time where there hasn't been a long period for um, in between, then the rate won't recover. So for example, here it is decaying, decaying, decaying. This is my infiltration rate. Then several hours later, here's my infiltration rate. It hasn't recovered like it did, for example, during this dry period. And that's what the continuous simulation is all about, getting that true hydrologic response based on the irregularity of the rainfall and its intensity in the dry periods. Let me go to uh, another small model that I created that will actually show you the role of the utilities. In this one, it is uh, continuous runoff. This one is uh, pretty simple. I just have one node in it and I've actually drawn the subcatchment that drains to it. I used the tool in this case to calculate the catchment area and the catchment area was directly entered into the dialog here as 132.643 acres. Well, I use the utilities which comes from here, tools, utilities, and this rainfall utility, I grabbed this um, rainfall which happened to be a standard format of National Weather Service diskette format. This is the formats that XP Swim is already predefined to read. Of course, you can go into the user defined and read your own rainfall data. In this section called More, this is where you can go and do a synoptic analysis on the rainfall. And in fact, this um, rainfall I broke it up by six hours of dry constituting a new storm and I analyzed for all these um, statistics. Let me just go, hopefully I'm not going too quickly with these dialogues that you're getting a good refresh on your screen. Uh, I'm going to go to the uh, get that rainfall analysis. This, The results from the rainfall analysis show up in the text output file and there is some statistics based on each month and each year, but I want to get to the ranking of the events. So for each thing that I checked, and for example, I picked duration as one of them, it finds the longest duration storm. It says 46 hours. Now that doesn't mean it rained constantly for 46 hours. It just meant that there was no dry period longer than the one that I've entered, which was happened to be like a six that I used. So there was no more than six dry hours in this 46-hour period. Here's the return period. And you get rankings for other statistics like the intensity. This is the average intensity, so the total volume divided by the total time. And then you get it for um, volume. So for example, 10-inch storm on July 23rd, 1987. This is um, National Weather Service real data from Minneapolis. Imagine 10 inches. In fact, this was a pretty short time frame too. I think it was only about 18 hours of time. This is more than the 100 year event for Minneapolis. Well, so you do that, then you attach the interface file that that utility creates into this uh, dialog here, read rainfall file and runoff layer. So I've got the interface file attached. You use the global database to create a rainfall record and this rainfall record says use the rainfall interface file and you pick up the station that's on that file. This should indicate to you that you can have more than one station. Uh, so if you have a large area you could put three, four, five, six, seven, ten stations on it and then pick up the appropriate one that you want for a given catchment allowing you to model
storms that move across the subcatchment. Then after having solved and, and run this, of course I can show you the results if you like, here's the time series again, three years of rain data and corresponding flows. You might want to analyze the flow based on or using the statistics utility. So in my statistics utility, I'm analyzing for flow, and I've turned on that I want to look at total flow, average flow, peak, event, duration, inner event, and I want to get those moments. So of course this is something that I mentioned in the PowerPoint. And um, I've already run that. Let me just um, fire that up here. It was called statistics.ut. So here's my um, statistics run, and as I mentioned, it will rank all the events, and I chose to see things like total flow, peak flow, average flow, and so on. So here's the total flow. Here's the largest event. And it has 100%, uh, right, percent less than would be 100% of the other storms were less than this one. And then this is the return period. And, of course, I've got other things like the moments. Here's the mean, the variance, standard deviation, coefficient of variation, coefficient of skewness. And then other parameters like average flow, peak flow, for example, is coming. Here's the peak flow, the percent less than, 100 percent less than, 295 cubic feet per second was the highest. So these kind of statistics are pretty important, especially if you're trying to size what kind of detention retention facility. Like, I think this one is pretty interesting is to know what the average volume is for storms and the peak volume and so on. All right, so that's a little bit about using those utilities. I did want to um, show you another model that's using LID. Sorry, I keep forgetting to go from my recent files since I've prepared these things earlier today. So continuous event with LID. Yes, definitely this one. Now, at this node, MH1, what I've done is I've broken up the catchment into the impervious area and the pervious area, and then I've provided um, a swale or rain garden for it to um, uh, drain to, and I've actually drained uh, subcatchment too. So I'm taking all my impervious area and draining it to, so I, I'm using flow redirection, draining to, subcatchment number four. This is my base case, so I don't check it here, but in my scenario I've checked it. And then the subcatchment number four happens to have infiltration rates that represent swale. If this is a topic that interests you, I'd encourage you to go to our homepage and you know uh, see our webinar on low impact development modeling where we explain these things in a lot more detail. But it's a catchment that has 14.4 inches of storage and times its area if you wanted to get the volume. And so I've used the scenario manager to have a with and without LID. So if I review results on this one and I'm going to be able to compare you know, whatever time series I want to look at, but right now I'm on flow. If I want to see the flow for manhole one, my base, and then with LID, if I zoom in first to this first storm, you'll see that my um, with LID has a much smaller peak flow. And that's because I took my impervious surface and I drained it to a place where I could store the water and infiltrate it and evaporate it away. Well, I'll, let me undo the zoom here with a right mouse click. If I look at the big event, in fact, I got a little bit more peak flow. But this is indicative of LID. If it's not sized right, it's overwhelmed um, because there's only so much storage and infiltration capacity there, and uh, they lose their benefit. They're only good for things about, uh, say, three to six-month return period, and then they lose their effectiveness. They don't replace 
regional detention facilities, they just lower the total size requirement of them. So they're great for retrofit, and of course they have all kinds of um, good benefit for um, water quality. But as a flood control device, they're not a flood control device, not really. All right, the last model to show you is um, one that has a little bit of groundwater in it. I wanted you to see the uh, groundwater So if I double click on this node GW, it has this catchment, this rain and infiltration, and the notice that the groundwater is optional. So it's not necessary to simulate groundwater if um, you know you can factor it out as not being important. But of course, as I mentioned, as soon as you get to continuous simulations, more processes become important. This groundwater flow that I compute is being drained to the channel. And the groundwater is described here. Here's my upper zone, lower zone, depth to the base of the aquifer. My groundwater outflow is this equation, which uh, has lots of terms in it. But the way that I've implemented it in this example, with uh, ones and zeros in strategic coefficients and exponents, it's been reduced to a simple linear reservoir, meaning that the groundwater flow per acre is a1, which is 0 0.005 CFS times D1 minus B0, D1 minus B0, so the height of the water table over the boundary raised to the 1, so it's a linear reservoir. 0 0.005 cubic feet per second per acre per foot of head difference. Quite simple. But this equation can be used to model more complex groundwater equations like Dupuy-Forsheimer, Hoogout's equation by putting in appropriate values. So the, there's an infiltration and percolation description here. So there's parameters to model the movement of the soil from the upper and lower zones. And then there's evapotranspiration where, this is one of my favorite pictures in the dialogues, <laughs> where we can um, say how much ET is occurring from the upper and lower zone. and what's the wilting point and field capacity of the soil. So with that groundwater, I've already solved this one, so I think I can just show you the review results. I've clicked on review results here. Like infiltration, if I want to see groundwater flow, I simply click on this um, properties icon, and I include it, because it's not there by default. I include to see groundwater series, and those are part of the hydrology flows. So this line that I'm sort of tracing now with the mouse is the groundwater flow over time. This is only three days of simulation. I guess you, we could argue that that's not continuous simulation. But uh, of course, if you had a continuous time series, you would see the groundwater flows um, contributing and not contributing, uh, depending on the, uh, where the water table is compared to that boundary condition. So I, I think that's uh, all the material that I had to present. I think I do have maybe one more PowerPoint. Probably just says, uh, "Do you have any questions?" <laughs> so again, thanks for your time and thanks. Mm -hmm.